We're fundamentally narrative creatures. That's how our brains are organized. You don't have any positive emotion, and that's not good. There's no sovereign individuals. Your group identity is paramount. You have no unique voice. You're a mouthpiece of your identity group. You can't speak across group lines because you don't understand the lived experience of the other. Let's go. I mean, I know so many in this audience, and not just here in New York, but we hear from our members all over the country. They're so concerned about what their children and what their grandchildren uh, are both being taught, but also what they're coming back home from college and, and talking about and saying, where are, you, where, where are they learning? I mean, they know where they're learning, but how is this get seeping into them? You obviously have spoken not, not just at the University of Toronto, but colleges all over the world. What is it you see today on the campus or among young people today that, that is, that's new or, or is it new? I've heard you say that we're no more polarized today than we were maybe even under Richard Nixon and the campuses were more on, on fire then than even they are today. So what are the similarities and differences that you're seeing? Well, I don't, I don't see any real evidence that your society is more polarized, generally speaking, than it has been at many times in the past. And I think the Nixon era is a good example. I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it merely statistically, I mean, you've been split 50-50 Republican-Democrat for, what, five elections now, and it's almost perfect 50-50 split. That really hasn't changed. Um, Trump, of course, is somewhat of a wild card, and so that complicates things, but I don't think it changes the underlying dynamic. Um, what I what I do think is is has arisen again because it's made itself manifest many times in the last hundred and hundred years is the rise of this group identity associated quasi Marxist viewpoint with this additional toxic mixture and, and paradoxical mixture of postmodernism um, the postmodernists are famous for being skeptical of meta-narratives. That might be a d defining, that was Lyotard, I believe, who, who coined that, although I might be wrong. It was one of the French postmodernists. And that, that means that they're skeptical about the idea that uniting, large uniting narratives are valid. And it's a, it's a huge problem, that claim, because the first question is, well, how big does the narrative have to be before it's a meta-narrative? Right? I mean, is the narrative that holds your family together f a falsehood? Is the narrative that holds your community together a falsehood? Like, how big does it have to be before it becomes a falsehood? And so, it's a very vague claim. And it's a very, it's a very dangerous claim, in my estimation, because I believe that, and I believe the psychological research is clear on this. What we have, we, our cognitive abilities are nested inside stories. We're fundamentally narrative creatures. That's how our brains are organized. And so to deny the validity of large-scale narratives is to deny the validity of the manner in which we organize our psyches. And that's unbelievably destabilizing for people. I mean, first of all, look, the simplest story in some sense, is that I'm at point A and I'm going to point B. And that's not as simple a story as it might sound because it implies that you are somewhere and that you know it, you have a representation of it, geographically, let's say, socially, psychologically, you have some sense of who you are. But more importantly, you have some sense of who you are transforming yourself into. And so that gives you a direction. And now that direction the direction gives you meaning. And, and, I, and I don't mean that in a cliched sense. What I mean is that the way that our brains are constituted is that almost all the positive emotion that people feel, and it's also true of animals, by the way, is it emerges as a consequence of observing that you're making your way to a valued endpoint. So, you know, you think, well, what makes you happy is the attainment of something. And there is a form of reward that is associated with that. It's called consumatory reward. It's the satisfaction that you feel, say, after you have a delightful Thanksgiving meal. But that isn't 
the hope and the meaning that people thrive on. The hope and the meaning that people thrive on is the observation that they're moving towards something worthwhile. And that might be individually, although it, it really can't be because we live in collectives, but it should be collective. And that isn't optional. If you don't have a goal, a transcendent goal, say, something that's beyond you, then you don't have any positive emotion. And that's not good because you have plenty of negative emotion. And, and that's, that's the problem with fundamental claims of meaninglessness, too, in life. That it, it's, this, it's the philosophical error that's made by nihilists, let's say, who say, well, life is meaningless. It's like, well, if you're a nihilist, genu genuinely, you've lost all hope. Your life isn't meaningless. It's just unbearably miserable. And that's, and that's a form of meaning. You know, that suffering is a form of meaning. And you can try to argue yourself out of that with your nihilistic rationalizations, but that is not going to work. You need a transcendent goal in order to withstand the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And the destruction of the narratives that guide us individually, psychologically, and that also unite us socially, familial and socially, it's an absolute catastrophe. And, well, the question then is, why is it being undertaken? And that's a complex question um, that, and I don't know if we can even discuss that. That, that has something to do with this un, in unholy marriage of the postmodern nihilism with, with this Marxist utopian notion which makes no sense at all because the postmodernists are skept skeptical of meta narratives, yet Marxism is a grand meta narrative. But coherency. It doesn't is, have to make sense. Well, that's, <laughs> well, it, that, in fact, the idea that it makes, that things have to make sense is part of the oppressive patriarchy, and so we can just dispense. <laughs> well, I'm serious. That people, 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 people teach that in, in a dead serious manner, that the requirement for logical consistency is an arbitrary. Um, it's an arbitrary imposition on cognitive structure. It's not something necessary for, for rational cognition, even if there is such a thing. I mean, you don't know how deep this war goes in some sense. I, I can give you an example. You know, there's a free debate about free speech on campus. But what you don't understand is it isn't a debate about who can speak. It's a debate about whether there is such a thing as free speech. And the answer from the radicals is that there isn't. Because for there to be free speech, you see, there have to be sovereign individuals, right? And those sovereign individuals have to be defined by that sovereign individuality. And they have to have their own locus of truth in some sense that's a consequence of that sovereignty. And then they have to be able to engage in rational, discursive negotiation with people who aren't like them which means they have to stretch their hands, let's say, across racial or ethnic divides. They have to be able to communicate and they have to be able to formulate a negotiated and practical agreement. And none of that is part of, and parcel of the postmodern doctrine. All of, that, all of that's up for grabs. There's no sovereign individuals. Your group identity is paramount. You have no unique voice. You're a mouthpiece of your identity group. You can't speak across group lines because you don't understand the lived experience of the other. And so it's not who gets to speak. It's whether the entire notion, which is a very classic Western notion and a very deep one of free and intelligible speech is even valid. I mean, these, these, this, this intellectual war that's going on in the universities is way deeper than a political war. It's, it's, it's and way, more, way more serious than a political war. It manifests itself politically, but, but no, it's, politics is way up the scale from where this is actually taking place. Mm -hmm.